Welcome to Visions, a series of visits to almost everywhere. I'm your host and fellow traveler, Herb Malsman. Today here on Visions, we begin a two-part look at the White House. Let's move along now to Washington, D.C. and the White House. Here we go. We are in the nation's capital, USA-style, Washington, D.C. Uh, right now, we're looking directly at the White House. Uh, one portion of one side, uh, I believe we're at the East Appointment Gate. I don't know now uh, whether we're here or not, but the sprinklers are going. Uh, uh, spring has finally taken hold old here. It is April the 26th, 1999, and spring is finally here uh, in real in all its regalia. Uh, the White House, uh, just to give you a little quick background as to as to the time of uh, the time of the day right now, the time of the week, the month, the year. Uh, NATO celebrated its 50th anniversary this weekend, and the White House was the uh, a scene for the festivities and the meetings and the and the getting together and the congratulations in the midst of uh, the uh, the Kosovo situation. Uh, NATO is very active these days. So the White House was the nerve center this weekend. Everybody meeting here. Of course, the president and uh, and dignitaries from around the world. There was a red carpet but treatment. They came in through the North Portico. Uh, so that's what's happening. We're, we're right here. And uh, I guess uh, this is a, a... The White House is closed to visitors on Monday, but we're going to get in here today. We have a special uh, we have a special one-on-one -on -one tour coming up and uh, we're going to be in there in uh, just a few moments. It is about... Uh, it is about 12, about 10 past 12 in the afternoon right now. Again, it's Monday, April the 26th. Uh, we came through security uh, uh, to uh, come through. Of course, it's a very secure area, as most of Washington, D.C. Um, coming through, we had to be uh, checked through by the guards, uh, and then we were sent through to a white tent, and that was where the, uh, the, the dogs were, the sniffing dogs. We had to have, the, we opened up the trunk and checked things out uh, to make sure we weren't carrying anything, and then we were invited to go through the gate and into this parking area right here um, and this is where we are we're right here at the White House I've been waiting six years six years to get in here for this tour uh, through the legalities and uh, getting uh, permission because it wasn't the regular tour a little more in-depth uh, tour that we needed so it needed a special special permission to get in here today um, so uh, that's what's going on we are going to be going in at one o'clock we have a two-hour window a two-hour uh, tour coming up uh, I believe Leave. We're going to meet Betty Monkman, who is the uh, who is the curator for the White House. Uh, we may be speaking with her. She may be doing the tour, but I'm not sure. I, I know we have at least one guide and perhaps a second guide. So we're going to get as far into the White House as we can. Again, it's a beautiful day. Another anniversary to tell you about. Not only, of course, is it the uh, 50th anniversary of NATO uh, this weekend, but today, uh, April the 26th, 1999 is the 13th anniversary of the nuclear uh, disaster at Chernobyl and to celebrate or to commemorate uh, that uh, that disaster uh, there is a computer virus uh, that's going to take hold today it's called Chernobyl and uh, and it's supposed to uh, confuse the hard drives and it's uh, and it's uh, going to be uh, very uh, desperate there are there are a couple of companies on the web that'll give you the inoculation free uh, to uh, to save you from this virus but it is called the Chernobyl virus, and uh, it's it's out to do its worst dirty work uh, imaginable, and uh, to celebrate or uh, again to memorialize, uh, to commemorate the 13th anniversary of Chernobyl. That is where we are right now, and I do want to make a couple of thank yous before we go in. I want to thank James Herndon and Ruth Foss and all the really good folks at the Library of Congress, uh, who, by the way, uh, supply uh, you with these tapes. Uh, the Library of Congress National Library Service for the Blind and Physically Handicapped. Uh, through all this, to get to, to get approved to come in here, to get clearance to come in, uh, the uh, the Library of Congress uh, gave their blessings. I also want to thank uh, Sharon Solomon, the director of the Equal Employment Opportunity. The vision. Uh, she was very instrumental in getting this thing moving along again after a six-year period. Uh, I kind of, somehow, they gave me over to Sharon, and she made this whole thing happen. She made this visit happen. She was very instrumental uh, setting us up and moving it along through the process. I also want to dedicate this program, uh, this uh, program, so program or programs, I'm sorry, I want to dedicate these programs, because uh, there'll be more than one segment. We're going to be here for a while. I want to dedicate this, uh, this uh, program 
program. The programs to Shirley, uh, Shirley, a, a, a good friend. She was very helpful in getting this tour set up. Uh, Shirley, I miss you. And uh, if you're watching today, uh, we finally made it. And thank you, Shirley. You're a wonderful person. And uh, and goodbye. <laughs> thank you, Shirley. Okay, that is the, that's the situation. That's the story. Uh, a dedication's out of the way. And thank yous out of the way. We'll get the thank yous later on. Um, we're going to shut tape right now and wait for 1 o'clock, or the appointed time, to uh, to get into the White House for this special tour. Again, you're listening to Visions, a series of visits to almost everywhere. I'm your host and fellow traveler, Herb Marsman. Let's cut tape. We're past security. We came through the East Appointment Gate. Uh, we checked in. We went through metal detector. Had, uh, the uh, tape recorder was checked. Everything was covered. I was beeping and banging and buzzing and beeping, and it turned out it was probably my belt buckle after I took everything metal I could think of off. Uh, it might have been my belt buckle. We're inside now. We're right, uh, right at the portico. I'm not sure exactly where we are, but this is where the appointments come through. We are not going to uh, be on tape until we get inside with Betty Monkman, uh, who will help uh, guide us along. So uh, let's uh, let's cut tape. Here we go. You're listening to Visions, a series of visits to almost everywhere. I'm your host and fellow traveler, Herb Mossman. We're in Washington, D.C. We're about to enter uh, the White House, and as soon as we can go back on the air, we will be with you. It is April 26th, 1999. It is about uh, 10 minutes to 1 in the afternoon. Let's uh, go inside. Let's cut tape. We are back on a tape right now. We're about to take the tour. It's going to take about an hour and a half. We're going to try to take you, uh, going to take you through the regular tour. But then we're also going to kind of give you a look at some of the uh, the out of the way places here at the White House. Before we move along, uh, we're with Betty Monkman, who's the curator here at the White House, and Jeff Bowman, who is with Secret Service. Sans glasses, by the way, <laughs> not wearing the shades. Uh, uh, Miss Monkman, before we go ahead, and I'll meet you in a moment, uh, Jeff. Before we move along, you have three portraits here, first ladies. Uh, one is uh, Miss Jackson, one is uh, Mrs. Tyler, and the other is uh, Bess Truman. Bess Truman, uh, do these, do you rotate the stock or do you, uh, there's always the three, and then you have a seascape here. Why these three in particular? We do have a collection of portraits of first ladies in the White House. We don't have them of every first lady, but we, we try to find them of every first lady. Um, a lot of the location for the president's portraits, as well as the first lady portraits, sometimes depend on their size, uh, when they were painted, and so forth. Uh, the portrait of Mrs. Tyler was actually the first portrait of a first lady to come into the collection in the 18... She actually sat for it in the 1840s, but it did not come here until uh, right before the Civil War. And it was given... Uh, um, by her uh, to start the collection of first ladies actually uh, the portrait of Mrs. Jackson is a posthumous uh, copy actually she died before her husband became president and her portrait original portrait is at the Hermitage Jackson's home in Tennessee so the people of Tennessee uh, paid to have this copy made of her um, which was given again to the White House as a gift and Mrs. Truman um, sat for a woman artist Greta Kempton when she was first lady and um uh, so we have a wonderful portrait of Mrs. Truman here. Oh, wonderful. Uh, Jeff uh, Bowman, let's move on to you for a moment. Can you give us some of the history? This is 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. A uh, little history of the White House, a little background. Correct. Uh, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue is the address, which is the north side of the White House. Um, a lot of people like to ask which is the back and which is the front of the White House. The White House really doesn't have a back or front. We have a north and a south because both entrances are used quite often for various events. Um, the White House itself, the cornerstone, was set on October 13th of 1792. It took eight years to build this home. It's made of sandstone on the exterior walls. George Washington, who of course was our first president, selected this site here in the district for the White House. He approved the construction plans. He appointed Irish-born architect James Hoban as the master builder, and uh, he provided some of the building materials that went into building the home. It took eight years again to build this home. George Washington left office in 1797 and died in 1799, so not only did he never live here as president, but he never got a chance to see the finished product as well. Our first occupant was our second president, John Adams, and he moved in on November 1st of 1800. Every president since has lived here for either all are part of their term in history. And George Washington actually died from a cure. 
They did not, they were bleeding him, he had a sore throat, and they, they the leeches, and they were taking a pint every four hours or something like that, and, and, that, and that did in George Washington. Well, I think he had become ill. He had been riding on his horse over his plantation in, the, in bad weather, and I think that was the beginning of his illness. Right. But taking a pint every, you know, I'm a blood donor, I know if you take a pint off me every four hours, I'm going to be a little bit uh, a little bit put out by it. Uh, didn't the, wasn't there a major fire here back, way back when? There was, during the War of 1812. It was actually August of 1814. British troops marched on Washington and burned the White House. Uh, the enti en entire inside of the White House was pretty much destroyed. The only thing left standing was the exterior walls, which were badly scorched. Right. Now, uh, is, is the White House set right now to, to reflect the Clinton's taste, and does that change uh, in a couple of years now? Does, it, does the, the, the administration coming in, the president and the first lady, or it could be the president and the first husband, uh, Elizabeth <laughs> Dole, it could happen. It, um, she'd be a pretty good choice. Um, could this, could, will that, will whoever comes in next decide, well, I, I kind of like this color and I kind of like, what can't you touch in the White House you know, when you're redoing it? There are many more restrictions in the public areas or the state rooms than there are in the family quarters. In the family quarters, the family can change them when they come in. They can change fabrics, move furniture, paint the walls, uh, pretty much make it their family quarters. But on the state floor in the public rooms, we do have an advisor commission of which the first lady serves as honorary chair so mrs clinton has served very actively as chair and that commission which is composed of museum directors and curators um, the chairman of the uh, national park services is um, or the director of the national park service is the chair of the committee they must meet and approve any changes in the public rooms and uh, there have been some changes during the clinton administration but it's not so much a reflection of uh, the president Ms. clinton's taste as it is a um, a joint decision of these professional museum people. So they all come together, and I guess the White House Historical Society, there, there everybody has a, ever, has a piece of that decision, I would well, imagine. Well, the White House Historical Association uh, doesn't get involved in the actual refurbishing, but they have very generously uh, raised uh, funds, and we, we have an endowment fund from which funds come to pay for those refurbishings, and that comes from the White House Historical Association. Now, just two more things, and then we're going to head out. Uh, the seascape, besides the fact it's beautiful, uh, what, why is it here? Uh, this is a painting um, by Corneille, an Italian uh, artist, uh, called The Landing of the Pilgrims. And it's a large uh, seascape, uh, a rather romanticized uh, seascape of the, the uh, boats coming ashore uh, in Massachusetts in 1620. And it's here because it's an early painting. Um, we thought visitors that come to this room might like to see uh, a scene of the early development of this country. Now, just before we go, one more question. Is it always ten, 10 after 1 here? Is there a significance to that, or just the clock is worn out? I think the clock probably needs some attention. <laughs> I thought there's some historical significance to 10 after 1, something like that. Okay, we're about to move along. You're listening to Visions, a series of visits to almost everywhere. I'm your host and fellow traveler, Herb Mossman. We're in the nation's capital, USA style. Uh, we're here in Washington, D.C. It is uh, Monday, April uh, 26, 1999. Uh, NATO is gone. I guess just about everybody is gone after the weekend, the 50th anniversary. For those of you with computers and hard drives and CD-ROMs that you may be experiencing a problem today, a virus called Chernobyl on the 13th anniversary of Chernobyl is uh, is either in the works right now or it's in the systems or it's about to go in the system. I mean, this thing is it's great. Uh, computers as our friends, the downside of the superhighway. Right now, Chernobyl may be uh, eating its way through somebody's hard drive someplace in uh, in the world. So, uh, and again, the 13th anniversary of Chernobyl, the uh, the nuclear uh, accident in, uh, in the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union. We're going to uh, we're going to stop tape right now, and then we'll meet you uh, as we take the tour. Here we go. Let's cut tape. We are outside now. We are going to, uh, we're at the front entrance, I guess, of uh, the White House here. We're looking at a very famous chandelier, up, or the hanging lantern. Sh lantern. Uh, this is famous uh, when the dignitaries uh, come here to the White House. Uh, they come up, uh, the, the president and first lady greet, uh, greet the visitors here, and then they're brought into the White House. This is also, uh, sadly, where John Kennedy, uh, this is where they pulled up. I guess in front of their hearse and the motorcade came through here. Uh, who wants to start? Let's start with Jeff okay. and the last name is Bowman. Oh, right. Currently we're on the north portico of the White House which again is the, uh, the address side to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. This portico is an eight column portico and again it's made of sandstone and, and marble stairs. Uh, as you're looking or viewing the White House uh, you can see intricate detail in the marble. Uh, off to the right is a uh, 
on the windowsill is an area that we left unpainted. Uh, shows the original sandstone that the White House is made of and show, even shows some scorch marks from that fire of 1814 just as a reminder of all of us. The uh, White House went under a renovation on the exterior through 1990 to 1994 or 6, 96, uh, where we actually had stonemasons come in and they took all the coats of paint off the White House, brought it back down to its original sandstone, and then gave it a fresh coat of paint. There's something happening right here. You have some scaffolding up. This is, a, this is I guess, a rehab uh, year. I know Washington Monument is uh, getting a do-over, a makeover. And what's happening here? This is not actually a rehab. This, these are screens to... Uh, to screen uh, the arrival ceremony uh, on Saturday night from people in the park, uh, so that and the photographer and the press would stand on the scaffold and take photographs of the um, uh, heads of state as they arrived for the uh, dinner on Saturday evening. Okay, so now I was watching C-SPAN and uh, the uh, the dignitaries were coming in uh, from NATO, and uh, they were coming in, and there was a there was a, a, a lady here uh, from the White House. She was uh, doing some sort of protocols. Uh, what was her title? What was she doing? Um, her name was Mary Mel French, and she's actually with the State Department. She's the ambassador of protocol. And for the dinner on both Friday nights and, and Saturday night, we had an, uh, 18 heads of state here on Friday evening and 44 heads of state here on Saturday evening. Um, she would meet and greet each head of state here on the North Portico and then escort them into the White House, where they were taking up, taken upstairs uh, to meet with the President and First Lady, and then brought down the grand staircase for their official entrance into the NATO dinner. And who is the host? Was it the State Department or was it the White House? Well, at the White House, the President is always the host at the White House. The President or the First Lady are always the host or hostess at the White House. I'm just wondering how, why State Department protocol, well, I guess, versus well, State Department. Uh, uh, well, State Department uh, handles all protocol with uh, foreign heads of state or foreign visitors. Oh, so it's a good question then. Okay. Uh, how did you feel about, I mean, uh, when I heard the the protesters at NATO go home and so on and so forth, uh, at the one at, at the one thing you say to yourself, well, you you know, I mean, it's not really perhaps putting a best foot forward, but at the other, at the other side of the coin, the other side of the coin, it, it really does show what America is all about because you can have protesters, you can have people voicing their a difference of opinion, and not be, and not be. Uh, I wouldn't worry about the noise. I need the sound, uh, and not be, uh, and not be shushed or, or carted off and, and, and banned away someplace. So I mean, there was that, there was that that uh, contrast well, here. Lafayette Park, which is directly north of the White House, has always been a center uh, for the last 30, 40 years, for, or longer than that even, for and Pennsylvania Avenue, for, for people protesting policies and issues. Um, I know there's a tent city here. and Okay, we're going uh, to go inside and start, because I know you have a schedule to maintain, and uh, and I have to get my car back uh, eventually. Let's uh, We're going to head inside. Let's cut tape. We are inside now. Where are we? Uh, can I call you Betty? Betty, sure. We're standing in the entrance hall, which in the 19th century was the um, great hall for all visitors to the White House not only heads of state, who well, very few heads of state came in the 19th century, but any visitor that would come to the White House would have come into this great hall. Uh, they would have gone up the stairs to the President's offices, which were on the family floor directly above where we are standing today. And um, even the family would use this entrance as well. Um, that changed in the 20th century. They now use an entrance on the south side of the house. But in the 19th century, this was the only entrance for people to enter into the White House. Uh, Jeff, describe the space we're in right now. Okay, we're in a large foyer. There's a Tennessee marble on the floors with Vermont marble on the on the walls and uh, six columns that are in the center of the, the foyer. Um, to our left is the grand staircase. It's a red carpeted staircase that leads up to the residence. The White House itself is made up of six levels. We're standing right now on the fourth level of the White House. Uh, two basement levels that are the uh, contain all the shops that are needed to keep the home running, the plumbing shop, the electrical shop, the carpenter shop. There's bomb shelters down there, bowling alley, kitchen. Uh, on the ground floor level are uh, a few rooms that we'll take a look at as well. We're currently on the state floor and again it's the third floor. And then the top two levels, the fifth and sixth floor, are the private living quarters of the first family. 
total of about 67,500 square feet. And lots of red. I mean, I, is this uh, everybody coming through here sort of gets the red carpet treatment and the red yes. drape treatment? Well, it is true. The red carpets have been taken up now, but on, uh, for uh, the arrival on Fridays and Saturday evening when the dinners were held, there was a large red carpet uh, out on the north, under the North Portico. And I kind of feel uh, kind of special right now because you're wearing a, 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 a red tie, or, you know, uh, and I'm not wearing a tie. It's kind of warm for me. But, uh, Betty, you're in a red jacket, so I kind of feel like there's a red jacket tie. I welcome. I'm getting here. Can I can I stretch a point and say that? Certainly. <laughs> okay. Uh, where are we heading? Uh, by the way, we're looking at a, a very famous portrait of uh, John Kennedy, yes. uh, JFK. In this entrance hall, we do try to hang the more recent presidential portraits because the vis this is the area in which the uh, visitors, the public visitors, will exit the house, and so we do try to show portraits of uh, presidents that they would be very familiar with. And one is a portrait of President Kennedy, which is a posthumous portrait. It was painted after his death from photographs, um, but it was a portrait selected by Mrs. Kennedy to be the official portrait, and it shows him standing with his arms folded and his head bowed and uh, many people have questioned as why the artist painted him with his head bowed so that you cannot see his eyes but uh, the artist said he really wanted to portray him as a man a thinking man he's and definitely uh, thinking his arms crossed he's definitely in a, a thinking posture right and the other portrait across the hall is one is our most recent presidential portrait and that's uh, President Bush and he is seen again standing um, uh, with a desk uh, that he used in his office upstairs with one of his favorite paintings in the background. Okay, let's uh, let's cut tape. And I'm looking at some busts. I see Abe Lincoln. I see George Washington. Uh, some various busts uh, along the along the wall. Is that Betty? Do you want to say anything about the piano? Yes, I do. Harry Truman, maybe. Uh, well, it's, it predates Harry Truman a little bit. It was a piano. It's a great uh, grand uh, piano made by the Steinway Company, and it was uh, presented as a gift by the Steinway Company when Franklin Roosevelt was president in 1938. And it has various scenes of American music stenciled on it. But its legs are large gilded eagles um, with their wings spread and uh, uh, many many uh, very famous pianists have played on this piano as well as President Truman did play on the piano. Uh, President Nixon also played on it at one time when he gave a birthday party for um, Duke Ellington which we are now celebrating uh, his birthday uh, this spring. Uh, he could tickle the ivories old Richard Nixon. Uh, yes, he could. <laughs> okay, well, moving along here, I see 1817, 1890, 1817, the year to the top, 1792, uh, dash, 1902, and 1952. This denotes what, these years? These are the major renovation dates of the White House. Again, 1792 was when the cornerstone was set. 1817 was the renovation after the fire of 1814. In 1902, Theodore Roosevelt pretty much completed the White House mansion itself uh, prior to his... Uh, becoming president. The ground floor was the basement floor. It was unfinished and, and he pretty much finished that off. And then through the years 1948 to 1952 under Harry Truman was our structural renovation of the White House. The Army Corps of Engineers came into the home, uh, totally gutted the White House, dug the two additional basement levels, put in steel support beams, filled it all back in, and this is the home as, as we see it today. Uh, this, by the way, is set into the into the uh, uh, the floor of it as we're coming through. That's where we're seeing this. All of a sudden and I was watching presidents and al analysts the other night with James Coburn when he came through the door. I kind of thought of James Coburn in that film. I don't know if you saw it, but he's he's kind of uh, asked to be the president analyst. And after a while, he's uh, you know people are coming after him. And uh, anyway, that's what I did. Is this the red carpet that was used? It is, and it's uh, it's rolled up uh, today, unfortunately, because uh, we're re we're taking down some chandeliers to be rewired and to be repaired. So it normally is is a long red carpet that extends the length of this court which is, I don't know how many feet long, do you, Jeff? Uh, 85 feet, 85 or itself, correct. I was going to say like 90, so, but you must have it correct. I, I know you'll be checking it later on. Let me see that one. At one end of the corridor, we have the East Room, which we will go into. Uh, at the opposite end is the State Dining Room. So it's this corridor that um, oftentimes um, the President and First Lady will walk down, escorted by um, military color guard and, and uh, uh, so forth. And then off to the other end, on the south side of the house, we have three parlors, the Green Room, the Blue Room, and the Red Room, which we'll also go in today. Uh, the East Room, that wouldn't be where Public Casals was and... Uh, yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, this is where he appeared? Yeah. I kind of think of him because uh, he's, his name came to mind just now. So this is where they have the, uh, the concerts and the recitals and, the, and, and those performances. And often during this administration there have been several state dinners here as well as Jeff could speak to. Uh, we have one coming up on Monday, May 3rd, state dinner for the premier of Japan. Um, this is more notably the room that President Clinton uses for most of his large press conferences. He will walk down the hallway with the long red carpet standing just in, inside the room in front of a podium, and then we'll have about 120 White House press seated in this area asking various questions. The room itself is uh, 80 feet long, 40 feet wide, and 20 feet high. Very versatile room here at the White House. Uh, we're standing right over here, but here's where the lectern would be when he makes the, when he makes the, has the press conference, so all the chairs are turned around. That, that's what confused me. So he comes down this hall, and he comes through, and he comes right to the, right, right to the podium, or lectern. He's actually on a riser, uh, so he's a little bit above, so the cameras that are set up in the back of the room can and get a good view of the president mm -hmm. and then directly behind us inside uh, either side of the wall are two large wooden doors uh, mahogany with a cherry inlay that closed. It? Yeah. and this would start the press conference and when the doors close the conference begins correct okay and uh, is there a uh, I, uh, is, is there a certain color you should wear I mean I know he, uh, the president wears a lot of blue perhaps to just the season uh, what looks good in this backdrop Do, are they are they aware of you know how best to look and how best to uh, what color that's a question for television people uh, uh, we, um, that's not something we get too concerned with I just thought of Helen Thomas who per, perhaps still today wears red and she made the point that the reason why she does she's she She's easy to spot at a press conference, so she tended to go to red. Well, it's a red. <laughs> this room is gold and white, actually. Uh, it's, uh, the carving in this room um, it was first done in 1902 under Theodore Roosevelt and then modified slightly under President Truman in 1952. Um, but it's carved wood and uh, a very elaborate plaster ceiling. Uh, three enormous uh, cut glass chandeliers made in uh, Bohemia that date from 1902 as well. And I see a George Washington, another famous portrait. You see that portrait a lot, uh, rather large. And uh, Theodore Roosevelt. And who would be these two? And is that Gar Garfield? Um, that is um, Martha Washington. Oh, no, Garfield to the left. Uh. McKinley, William McKinley. Okay, McKinley, uh, Martha Washington, George Washington. Well, there you go. Uh, it kind of fits. And uh, Teddy Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt. Okay, and how big is this room give us a you're good with the dimensions go for it uh, 80 feet long 40 feet wide and, and 20 feet high and if I could add the uh, portrait of George Washington here in the East Room is the probably the most famous portrait of Washington it's the 1797 Gilbert Stewart portrait and it's the one that Dolly Madison had rescued from the fire of 1814 right. the only thing that survives in the house that was here prior to the fire it came in 1800 the government bought it and moved it into the house here so that it would be here when John Adams moved in November right. 1800. I was at Morris Jamel Mansion in the Bronx, and uh, Washington actually was there during uh, during the war because he could watch the rivers, you know, both rivers coming up. And he actually, I was in his office, and it was interesting to see a little portrait of him, a little painting uh, with dark hair. I mean, as a young man, and you you hardly ever would see anything like that. But here it was. They had the secret doors, the passageways. So that's. Uh, uh, you know, I get, I, I, do you know Morris Jamel? I, guess, I, know, I know the house. Yes, I do. Uh, I must say that uh, although Washington did not uh, live here in the house, he was so revered by and, ha and is still revered by presidents that we have more portraits of Washington in the White House than any other president. You, you're right in the middle of Washington also, so that, uh, that's... Uh, well, of course it was named. The city was named for, for him. Sure. It wouldn't have been the, the first president that came in, but it's the only president ever to be here. That's what it's named after. Jeff, you want to say? If I could just add one last thing about the East Room. This is where after a state dinner all the guests will dance, uh, ballroom style dancing with uh, normally the uh, uh, one of the uh, armed forces bands will set up, Navy band, um, the President's own Marine band will set up here in the East Room. Okay, uh, let's move along. We'll cut tape. Here we go. We're back in. Uh, we're back on tape. And uh, what do we want to say about this really beautiful room here? It's off the east. It's off the east room. East. It's one of the three parlors known by their colors. And uh, this, the green room, is covered with a, a silk fabric on the walls, and it's, it's it has a sort of a moiré or a watered uh, effect to it. 
um, and uh, it's it is one of the few rooms in the house that are covered with with fabric mm -hmm. okay. is it safe to say that there everything in this building in this house is priceless I would say that uh, priceless and irreplaceable this furniture uh, for example is uh, Duncan's Pipes Federalist period um, pretty much the uh, the paintings and, and the portraits and, and china throughout the home are, are irreplaceable. And who are the portraits? Would that be... Was that Over the mantle. And actually, this is one of the original mantles that was installed in the house when it was rebuilt in 1817. It's made of beautiful Italian uh, Carrara marble. And the uh, shelf of the um, mantle is upheld by these um, sort of caryatids, these women uh, uh, based on Egyptian and Greek uh, motifs, but over the mantle is a wonderful portrait of Benjamin Franklin, and it was painted in England in 1767 when he went to um, protest the Stamp Act and, and other things that were happening prior to the Revolution. And he is seated at a table, a wonderful in a wonderfully vivid green uh, coat uh, with his gray wig on, and, and a bust of Isaac Newton peers down um, on him. Um, which is resting on the table. I wonder what he's reading. I think it's some contract, some monetary contract that he was involved with uh, for a man who then commissioned the artist to paint this painting. And on the on the left is uh, Jan oh, I can make it out from here. James Polk is on the left, and on the right is uh, Benjamin Harrison, who was president in the late 1880s, early 1890s. <laughs> Visualize for me, or paint a picture. Okay, we're sitting in a room, standing in a room right now. Uh, is the president, uh, Mr. Mr. Clinton or Hillary Clinton, uh, uh, will they, I mean, I just can't imagine it's the kind of house that, you know, I mean, in my apartment, I go hang out in the living room, I, I haven't seen the television yet, I'm sure there are, but uh, I mean, will they come in and just kind of sit down and, uh, you know, just kind of sit by the fireplace and lounge and be leisurely and casual and that sort of thing, is it, it's, it's sort of stayed sort of, a, is it a, is it, a, is it a very, is it a livable kind of room, just when nobody's here, they just, We'll look around here and yeah. You know, I mean, give it just give the us a sense of that. Itself is pretty much the main entertainment level. Of the White House um, on a normal day-to-day -day basement basis, the uh, the first family pretty much would uh, do any relaxing or reading up in the the living quarters, and then use these rooms for more formal occasions. And they are all used during our formal events. Um, a lot of times, the president will have conversations with uh, good friends and visiting heads of state in in here in the green room or in any of the parlor rooms, uh, but they are used three to four times a week by the first family. Are they liable to be in here this evening, just, uh, you know, just sitting here and, and I, chatting? I don't think there are any formal official functions. Uh, and they're just the two of them? Uh, very seldom, I think, would they come down to this floor to do that sort of thing. They have uh, wonderful rooms upstairs that are available to them. Mm -hmm. So this is sort of, uh, okay, I, I kind of uh, wondered about that. All of a sudden I had this sense of them just sitting around them. If I can add, when uh, President Clinton came into office, and, and I've been here for both President Bush and President Clinton, so I'm assuming President Bush did the same, but one of the first things that President Clinton wanted was a very detailed tour of the White House. Uh, I've been here on the state floor on many occasions where the President will grab select guests or friends and then just start taking them around the state floor, and he has got an, uh, just an extraordinary memory. And he, he does a better tour than I could ever do, and uh, he does that quite often. I've heard him do that as well up in his office on the second floor and, and the Lincoln bedroom and so forth, and uh, he he knows his history and is very interested in, and keeps reading and uh, updating himself on various things. So he knows what the paintings are, what's happened in these rooms, wh how presidents have used the spaces and so forth too. I'm looking at a portrait of a Jimmy Carter, a misunderstood president and somebody who uh, is sort of, uh, who's blossomed since he left the White House, uh, Habitat for Humanity, and he's done some wonderful work and uh, not every president leaving office does, uh, does great work after they leave office and Jimmy Carter may have been a little restricted here, but he's moved along now. You, you're, you're smiling fondly, like uh, no, I mean, uh, you sound I, like you seem to like him. Uh, yes, I do. I admire Mr. President Carter uh, a great deal, but I was smiling because of a, a story about that painting. It was painted after he left the White House down in Plains, Georgia, and he selected an artist uh, from Connecticut, Herbert Abrams, to paint his portrait. And after the portrait was finished, I asked Mr. Abrams if he could write a little account of President Carter. Um, uh, 
uh, sitting for his portrait. And Mr. Abrams uh, related to me how they became such good friends because they loved to fly fish. And so a lot of their conversation while President Carter was sitting for that portrait was about fishing, mm -hmm. which I thought would be... It looks great. It's a very attractive painting, I think. And in fact, President Bush admired that painting a great deal and selected the same artist to do his portrait. Mm -hmm. Hey, look, so really wonderful. They're very, you know, a president comes into office uh, feeling young and perky and ready and, and goes out kind of uh, worn out. And you get, you you uh, you probably age uh, a week every day you're in the in this building uh, uh, working. Well, I think uh, that's very evident in, if you see photographs of President Franklin Roosevelt, who was here a little over 12 years in the house and from the time he came in in 1933 till the time of his death in 1945 there was a dramatic change in his physical appearance for the wear and tear of uh, the pressures of, of the uh, presidency on him right. okay now uh, and I don't want to get political or anything, but I'm not and I'm not going to get political but right now with uh, Kosovo is this sort of the eye of the storm in here the things kind of stay I'm just looking at the the, the sense in the White House uh, you know things are happening uh, there is there a calm in here? Is there an excitement? Is there, uh, is it business as usual? Is this sort of like the eye of the storm here? Is it um, always professional and always, you might know more about this. Uh, or well, the, the interesting thing I've found coming here to the White House is um, that the White House itself still maintains being a home. Um, the West Wing, where the President's Oval Office is, that's where he'll do most of his work. Over there, people running around, very busy place, a uh, lot of things happening. But once you come back here to the mansion itself, it, it is again a home and things are more calm, a little bit more relaxed and, and for social events it presents a very pleasant atmosphere no matter what's going on in the world. Sort of a refuge. I kind of thought I had the storm, you know, that sort of thing. But I might say that even though there are crises like Kosovo going on at the moment, um, the house continues to be open to the American public and uh, again, this is uh, Monday, the which we're taping this, but tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock in the morning, we'll have four to 6,000 people um, during the morning come come through to see the President's house. I expect to see glasses sitting around from everybody that was here, you know, this whole group. I just want to point out a few historic objects that are here in this room, the green room, that are associated with some of our early presidents. And one is a, is a very beautiful English uh, Sheffield coffee urn. And it was uh, purchased by uh, John and Abigail Adams when he was minister to England. And it has their monogram, J.A on the front of the coffee urn uh, and the candlesticks which are French late 18th century candlesticks belong to John, uh, James and Dolly Madison so I can't light one huh well, you can light the candles, yeah. <laughs> okay. the candles well, I thought these were candles from that, and you can't yeah, light the them. The candles themselves are fairly recent. <laughs> yeah. They're not, they're not uh, the candles from that back then. I do want to say so, uh, something about a few paintings here, too. Sure. Mrs. Clinton has been active in adding to the um, collection of paintings in the White House. Uh, we have a lot of portraits of the presidents, of course, and first ladies. And um, since Mrs. Kennedy uh, sort of began her program to um, add American art to the White House, the collection has grown tremendously, and we have many paintings of, the, of various uh, scenes of America throughout the 19th century. Uh, we have uh, in the green room our first painting by an African-American artist, Henry Tanner, and it's a scene of the dunes in at Atlantic City at the end of the 19th century. And they're actually, if you, you can't, it's hanging rather high, and so it's difficult for people to see, but if there was actually sand from the dunes on the canvas of, of that painting. And then we have a very... Um, much I, I just want to say, I was looking at the bottom one, looking at for the dunes in Atlantic City, but it's up there. Above, uh, b right below it, is a is a uh, fascinating scene of Philadelphia uh, in 1858. Uh, and in the background of that painting, it, there are a lot of people on the streets, a lot of wonderful um, 18th century buildings in the background, red brick buildings. But uh, in the background of that painting, you can see the steeple of uh, Independence Hall, where the Declaration of Independence was uh, was signed. Mm -hmm. 